Welcome to the EKG Guy if this is your first time. I'm glad you're joining us and welcome back if you're returning. So we're going through our EKG coding reference guide. We are now in part six, okay, and we're going to look at posterior MI. Previously, we looked at the acute setting, but in this case, we're going to look at something when someone's had one previously. How can we know that there's been posterior involvement? So we'll look at this on the EKG here. Now, if you don't have access, all you have to do is put this link into your search bar, enter your email, click submit. From that, you'll get an email. And from that email, there will be a link. And from there, you'll have instant access to the reference guide. There's all these drop down menus. So you'll click this drop down if you want to follow along here. You can also go back and listen to all the lectures on all this above. Okay, we've gone through rhythms, atrial abnormalities, conduction defects, voltage criteria for access hypertrophy uh, as well as conduction delays left anterior posterior fascicular blocks left bundle and right bundle blocks and so forth so and we've gone through a number of mi so you can look at that as well but in this lecture we'll focus on posterior mi so let's get started so posterior mi one that is age indeterminate or probably old meaning okay maybe it happened in the last week or so but it's not like something that's going on right now that we can likely intervene on okay and so how do we know that's the case well there's a few things you have to note remember that sequence and in our course with our books we go through all the layout of you know what changes you could expect but the main ones i want you to focus on are st elevation where we would see the injury pattern okay then there would be st elevation plus q waves forming and then we would have Q waves. Okay, those are the main ones in terms of coding that we have to be aware of. Okay, obviously there's other changes where the ST segment comes down and so forth, but uh, you can uh, with the T waves and so forth. But we will not go into that now. This is what you have to know for coding. Okay, is there that acute injury pattern that's going on? Okay, is there that infarct pattern where there's Q waves developing? Okay, and then is this old okay and that's where we just see the q waves and because there's a posterior mi remember there are no posterior leads in the standard 12 lead ekg and because of that we have to infer what's going on posteriorly from other leads and the leads we tend to use are the re right precordial leads v1 v2 and sometimes v3 can give us a good idea okay remember v1 v2 and v3 as you have imagine a patient's chest and i am probably the uh the worst artist so i'll attempt this but you have v1 i don't even have enough room so v1 v2 and v3 okay as they maybe even over over here all right as they come around from but they're going from right to left the right side to the left side okay and they stop around v6 here okay and we don't have enough to go around the back now if you wanted to add posterior leads you could add v7 v8 and v9 on the patient's back which give you an idea of the posterior portion of the heart but we don't have that on the standard 12 lead and that's why we use v1 to v3 in general okay and what we want to see is that uh, we want an initial r wave that there's at least 40 milliseconds in width okay so initial r wave and these are v1 and v2 we're looking at so imagine v1 and v2 we want the initial r wave to have a width of at least 40 milliseconds. The width of the R wave, okay, from here, maybe to here, maybe the, the nadir, the highest point of it, um, where you see the uh, inflection point, we want that to be at least 40 milliseconds. Remember, that is equal to one small box. And another thing that you want to note is this notching. This notching tends to be a pattern of scarring actually okay so where you see notching that tends to be uh, related to scarring in that portion of the ventricle now I know that this patient had an infra posterior MI so both inferior and posterior involvement because remember the inferior wall and the posterior wall may also be involved together because a patient may be right dominant in a previous lecture we looked at dominance and most patients are right dominant meaning that the posterior portion of the wall or of the the pda posterior descending artery is fed by the right coronary artery okay so you have the right coronary artery supplies the inferior portion of the heart 
okay? As well as sometimes the AV node and the SA node, but we won't go into all this detail. So think of it as the inferior portion of the heart. And then if it gives off the PDA, which it does in most because they're mostly right dominant, then you have the posterior wall as well. Okay, and a little other portions, but those are the main things you have to focus on. And if you have, imagine, if you have the RCA, imagine it comes around the heart. Okay, we don't have the heart here. So it's going to come around and then it'll go posteriorly. Okay, and then feed another artery, this PDA. Okay, so imagine this is the RCA. Okay, and what will happen is if you occlude it somewhere proximally, you'll affect all of the regions distal to it. Okay, and that's why you'll have the posterior uh, and inferior portions involved. And so that's not uncommon to see them both. So notice in the inferior leads, which are 2, 3, and AVF, we have these deep Q waves that have formed. And that's normally what we want to see with a prior MI. Okay, so a Q wave is the first negative deflection of a QRS complex. So if you imagine you have a P wave, you have a complex like this, this is an R wave. This is an S wave, this is an R prime wave, okay? Then maybe you have a T wave. Now, a Q wave is where you have the first negative deflection, something like this, okay? And this is the Q wave, this would be an R wave. So you wanna make sure you're seeing Q waves here, okay? And clearly you're seeing them form in these leads. And there are more than one of the inferior leads, so they're contiguous. So this patient actually had a prior inferior MI, okay, as well as posterior involvement because the proximal uh, right coronary artery was involved. So notice instead, because we said we don't have posterior leads, we're looking for opposite changes in those leads. So if you imagine you have a Q wave here, so imagine a Q wave and an R wave, what would be the opposite of that? Now a reflection of that might look like this, where this portion here that of the Q wave would now be an R wave, and then this portion here of the R wave would now be this S wave. So the opposite changes. And that's what we want to look at in those uh, right precordial leads. So notice these leads, you have these big R waves that are forming here. You have some notching, a wide um, R wave in V1 as well, and maybe even V2 as well there, okay? A bit narrow in V3, but so focus on these leads here. Um, and then concordance, okay? And concordance meaning that the main QRS vector and the T wave are going in the same direction, okay? In this case, we have the main QRS vector likely positive, but this is negative, okay? And you may wonder why is that the case? Same thing here in V2. Notice that these QRS complexes are mostly positive and this T wave is negative. This is discordant, all right, and not something we always see. And why that may be the case in this patient is there's something called memory T waves. And memory T waves are when you have inverted T waves that tend to stick around, okay? And they may actually stick around for years and maybe never go away. Uh, and these memory T waves may stay away, uh, stay for some time, but eventually maybe flatten out and revert back to normal. Okay, so that's something you could see. Now, one key point in those leads, V1 and V2, you do not want to see any ST segment changes when you have this age indeterminate or probably old. So no evidence of acute posterior injury. Injury. So no ST depression. Notice there's no ST depression in these leads, okay, at all. So again, main things, initial R wave, oh, that's wide. You have the R to S ratio that is greater than one. Well, what does that mean? Well, look here, this R wave to this S wave is greater than one. So R to S greater than one. And what does, imagine this is about 10 millimeters, uh, small boxes, and maybe this is five. So you could do 10 to five, and that equals two, which is greater than one. That's just an example of what that means. So, um, so the R to S ratio is greater than one in those leads. Uh, you have that width of 40 milliseconds or more than that in of the initial R wave. And we also mentioned that, yes, you may see concordant T waves, but that's not always the case. The main thing you want to make sure is that you're seeing the opposite changes of them. Remember, okay, so you're seeing these R waves that represent posterior Q waves, okay? And in the inferior leads, we did see that, and that's why that's this is inferior posterior 
am I? Okay, not uncommon that we see both of them. Main thing, do not want to see no evidence of acute posterior injury where we would see ST depression. So no ST depression here, they are flat, okay? And you want to also exclude other causes of um, tall R waves in V1 and V2, okay? Now, right ventricular hypertrophy, usually that's a diagnosis of exclusion, but in this case, notice that there's no right axis deviation. The axis here, the QRS axis is was about three degrees, okay? So within normal limits. If you saw a right axis deviation, you might want to think, rethink this whole situation, but in this case, we don't have that. So this patient actually had uh, a previous infraposterior MI, and this is what we're seeing as the resulting phase of that with those R waves that are representing Q waves in the right precordial leads to represent uh, posterior involvement. And then in the inferior leads, we see these Q waves of prior inferior involvement. Okay, so a lot here. Now, uh, please feel free to go back, and if you want to look at that dominance where we looked at right dominance, go back and listen to the previous lecture. Okay, and if you want more on our courses, and this is maybe too advanced for you, remember we have over 400 lectures online. We have our courses available that are also there in the books. Well, that's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something. Now, just to keep you in mind uh, of our course material that we have available, so again, if you go to our website, www.ekg.md, okay, so this is our website, and what you'll notice is that if you go to the EKG course here, okay, you'll find stuff that's separate. So notice that we have a number of topics, practice material, lectures, a way for you to contribute, and this is the course here over here. So you'll notice we have over 300 videos or so, and that's more on YouTube. There's another 100, more than 100, about 200 videos that are available with the course. So those are separate videos. And this course is really designed to take you from a beginner to advanced interpreter. Okay. So completely separate from what you're getting online for free. Okay. These are um, course material that comes with it. So notice that you have a book Okay, and then you also have the pocket guide available. So you can choose which format. They are the same thing, both these uh, book and the pocket guide, uh, different formats. Uh, I really like this small one because you can keep it in your white coat if you're in the clinic or in your pocket and it's really available on the go. Now with the book, you also get videos. So notice these are the videos, okay? And these are a video for every single page in that book. So it's over 30 hours of video. Now there's a number of practice material that I continue to upload there. Okay, we'll have practice questions coming soon. Uh, so all of that's available. Again, this is separate from all the free material that you get already. Okay, so this is more high yield stuff. This is what we used to teach our uh, technicians here and our students here at Mayo Clinic. And it's used now among many institutions. So use the, check that out. Now, what it also includes are calipers. So yes, you get calipers with this course, okay? Um, I don't know anyone else that offers that, but you do get calipers. I think they're very helpful and they can, uh, you know, if you know how to use them correctly, uh, can help to identify different uh, arrhythmias that are going on, okay? And then you also get our pocket EKG reference, okay? This was something we've put together as we were developing course for the fellows. Uh, and this is really nice. It has every code, as you saw earlier, laid out there, very small pocket guide available. I had help with uh, my colleague, Dr. Peter Noseworthy, who's the head of the EKG lab here at Mayo Clinic in editing it. So this is something that we use um, and we found very helpful. So go to the EKG course, you'll see examples of lectures, okay, why we developed this, okay, a lot of it came about from myself struggling with learning EKGs, having a father that was an interventional cardiologist and, you know, still struggling, so uh, my struggle is a struggle that I don't want you to have in learning them, okay, you can read all those introductory books, but honestly, they are not uh, enough, okay, and you find yourself using other resources which is part of the learning process. I wanted to expedite that process for you and make it less uh, inefficient uh, in pretty much what I struggled with going and learning through EKG. So again, from beginner to advanced level with this course, 
uh, you get the book, the calipers, the coding reference, video access, okay? And now we're offering 25% off. 25% off, put that code in on checkout and uh, you'll have yourself 25% um, off that will even, it's pretty much covers the cost of what we use to print the material. So uh, we don't really make much off it. It's more to help our learners grow and really be able to contribute to patient care. That's why we do this and we love doing it. So thank you so much for your support. Um, if you have any questions, just leave them below and we're happy to answer them. All right, have a great day.